Good morning, uh, welcome and thanks. I'm Michael McGinnis, the Executive Officer of the National Academy of Medicine and Executive Director of the NAM Leadership Consortium uh, for a Learning Health System. I have only two tasks today, and the most important one is to underscore the thanks uh, to, uh, to each of you. Uh, this is a room full of uh, extraordinarily uh, insightful, experienced, uh, and talented individuals who are leaders uh, throughout the field uh, of health, health policy, and in particular, obviously uh, in today's meeting, uh, the role of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in our health futures, uh, if you will. Um, this is the time in which we would naturally, uh, uh, under ordinary circumstances, go around and introduce ourselves individually. Uh, but today we're not going to do that because most of you know each other in one way or another. Uh, and um, uh, in, uh, because you are folks who've been involved together and, uh, and, and leaders in the field, if we had uh, a meeting that included everyone who had an interest in this topic today, we would certainly fill the auditorium. Uh, we were very selective uh, about uh, ensuring that we had the right folks in this meeting. and. Uh, uh, again, I underscore my appreciation uh, on that respect. Uh, we have uh, groups, uh, essentially uh, our aim today is to, uh, to pull three broad groups together, uh, health professionals, uh, those who represent uh, the clinical community, uh, the uh, groups who are developing technology in, in AI, uh, and those who are from government agencies uh, who bridge that uh, set of players who both are developers, who are users, and who have to help set the guardrails. So it's in a very important conversation uh, for us today, and we uh, appreciate your being here. We have, uh, f from the government stakeholder perspective, we've got uh, uh, really key leaders from the Department of Defense, the VA, NIH, FDA, CDC, ONC, uh, NSF, FTC, apologies for the uh, alphabet, but uh, I think most folks here are aware of the initials GAO, and not a government agency, but important to all of us, as well as uh, PCORI. Uh, we have developers from Google, Microsoft, uh, Epic, and, uh, uh, and others, and health professional groups from family physicians, uh, pediatricians, American Medical Association, uh, and, of course, a number of leaders uh, in academic settings uh, who are uh, critical uh, in helping advance the field. So, uh, again, thanks, and special thanks not only to each of you, but to the sponsors of this meeting. Uh, the the uh, uh, meeting is uh, supported by the Gordon uh, and Betty Moore Foundation, uh, as well as by the Doric Duke, uh, Duke uh, uh, Charitable Trust. And so uh, thanks to our sponsors uh, for uh, their insights in realizing the importance of this particular meeting. My second task is to set a bit of the context. And um, I will move through that fairly quickly, beginning with the NAM mission. Uh, now, this is actually soon to be our former mission because under Victor's leadership, uh, the National Academy of Medicine has been undergoing a, uh, an intense uh, refresh of our uh, strategy, a strategic plan. Uh, and uh, uh, it, the rollout of the, uh, of the uh, new strategy will be uh, forthcoming in a couple of months. Uh, but the spirit of this mission uh, will be carried forward and enhanced uh, with the new mission, and it is essentially to improve health for all by advancing science, accelerating health equity, and providing independent, authoritative, and trusted advice uh, nationally and globally. And there's no more important topic uh, to embody uh, the uh, link between the Ma National Academy of Medicine's activities and the really fundamental issues for progress in health and medicine than the one we're talking about today. Uh, our job is to look to the horizon uh, uh, with all of you, and the horizon here is bright, it's dark, it's uncertain, depending upon your perspective, uh, but it's clearly important. Uh, the next slide, please. 
Uh, here, here's one quote from one of our NAM members by uh, augmenting human performance. AI has the potential to markedly improve productivity, efficiency, workflow, accuracy, and speed, both for clinicians and for patients. What I'm most excited about is using the future to uh, bring back the past, to restore care uh, in, in health care. That's Eric Topol. Of course, I could have picked a quote from another NAM member that would have been a little less rosy than this. So there are many perspectives, and the importance is that we roll our sleeves up and get a, uh, as much a feeling uh, for the state of play and where it's going and what we need to look for. Next slide, please. Uh, the NAM Leadership Consortium uh, is uh, uh, actively involved in this work because uh, it's an unusual opportunity for stakeholder leaders in public, private, and independent organizations from key sectors in health and healthcare to collaborate under the auspices of NAM uh, for action on their common interests. And I underscore the word action uh, in advancing effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and continuous learning. On the action dimension, um, one of our uh, key foci has been to pull together these groups. Next slide, please. Uh, which include uh, on the consortium patients and families, clinicians, healthcare delivery organizations. Without going through the whole list, it's all of you and your stakeholders and your colleagues from the various perspectives around the country, including government agency heads, uh, 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 such as those that uh, I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Our focus uh, uh, under Victor's leadership uh, has been especially to emphasize action in, in everything that we do, to move beyond good ideas and interesting discussions uh, to the notion of catalyzing action in partnership with each of you, to draw, call upon our position as a trusted uh, vehicle for the kinds of discussions and action that are necessary. In the case of the Leadership Consortium, uh, the broad umbrella effort is on the notion of a, a learning health system, uh, which is defined and has been defined uh, in the charter for over a decade as one in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement, innovation, and equity with best practices and discovery seamlessly embedded in the delivery process, individuals and families, active participants in all elements, and new knowledge generated as an integral byproduct of the delivery experience. Now, when you think about generative AI and large language models, what could be a more important tool for each, for progress in each of these dimensions? Uh, it it is, has the potential, uh, clearly, to be revolutionary. And the focus of the uh, leadership consortium on the notion of alignment, because in our fragmented system, it's alignment that is critical uh, in order to enhance our uh, ability to capture the possible. Again, large language models and generative AI have the potential, if used in the right way, to enhance that alignment. Um, and we have a series of action collaboratives that you see listed here, evidence mobilization, digital health, value incentives and systems, and culture inclusion and equity. Uh, we have a number of other uh, fundamentally important action collaboratives throughout the NAM. This uh, meeting is being uh, uh, held under the sponsorship of the Digital Health Action Collaborative. Uh, next slide, please. And that Digital Health Action Collaborative uh, is co-chaired by Peter Lee, uh, who will be speaking to us uh, with us shortly, and uh, Ken Mandel uh, from Harvard, who is here. I saw him very close here, and there he is back there, uh, and has a number of network organizations. The um, collaboratives are organizational collaboratives. I'm not going to go into the details on this, but it's clearly important that as we try to improve alignment, we have the key organizational stakeholders involved. Uh, it's now uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the NAM president. I mentioned earlier uh, that um, Victor uh, has, as the first, actually, Victor Zhao is the last IOM president and the first National Academy of Medicine president, uh, and has, uh, throughout his tenure, emphasized the need to be at the cutting edge and the need to focus on action. 
Um, most of you have met him in, in one venue or another, uh, given the fact that he is very active. Uh, he came to the NAM uh, from his position as chancellor uh, and James B. Duke, professor of medicine at Duke University. Uh, and the, he's the past president and CEO of the Duke University Health System. And before that, he was the Hershey uh, Professor of Theory and Practice of Medicine and Chairman of Medicine at Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's, uh, as well as uh, Chairman of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. And his uh, work in the research arena has uh, led to a fundamentally important insights in cardiovascular medicine and genetics, uh, and uh, now uh, he's been a very active uh, leader across the board in health and health policy. Victor, thank you very much, and welcome to the podium. So, Michael, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. There's some coffee out there for those who need it. Well, uh, it's daunting to be among all of you because... You guys are the whiz kids, if you will. Uh, we really what's going on so exciting in medicine, which of course is uh, data science, AI, and uh, the future. Now, I think that uh, it was Peter Emby who said, there's an AI meeting every single day. Aren't you tired of going to them? So my eagerness to have this is to say, what are you going to do about this, right? I mean, I've heard everything you can imagine. The future of medicine is now, it's almost now. Gendered AI, what are you going to do about this? And machine learning and all the stuff you can imagine that AI can do in health and medicine. No question. I actually believe it will transform medicine. But the community like me, who's not AI experts, are waiting to say, okay, now I've read so much about this. I should be excited, I should be scared. Right? Uh, wow, you know, look at AI and gender AI. It can hallucinate, yet I've used it. It's really helpful to me when I write something. And you can imagine all the other stuff in AI machine learning. I think the committee wants to know, what do you want to tell us? What do you want to do with it? Right? So I hope we're not going to spend another meeting talking about this high level, all that stuff. It's getting now to practicality. And, you know, when I think about, I'm a practitioner. Well, not really. I don't see patients anymore. But if I'm a practitioner, I'd like to know what to expect, how to use it. Understanding their risk, but give me some guidance. Education. Wow, I can think of so much in education. Transformative. I've talked to people about this. You know, medical school is four years. Two years is preclinical takes two years to do preclinical. It's a really, I won't say waste of time, but it's a lot. Then you have one year of clinical in third year and fourth year go and interview for internship. We can really make medical school a lot more efficient. I hope someone's talking about changing the curricula by having a different way of learning. Yet we're also worried about if you learn this way, someone says, well, they stop thinking for themselves, use machine to do, but, you know, curriculum has introduced problem-based learning a long time ago, right? It is a bunch of students with a mentor or a senior faculty who says, well, here's a problem, let's solve it together. Let's look at literature, let's talk about this. Suddenly now with AI, it's going to be changing tremendously the way in which you look at problem solving, the way you learn things. Not only during medical school, lifelong learning. I, as an educator, would like to know what to expect for my, I mean, it's time is now for another Flexner equivalent, right? And so what I want to know about how this can be used, right? So you can imagine, I'm not even getting into, you know, drug development, clinical trials, you name it. Just practically, I think about this. And as policymaker, so a lot of what we do at Academy, as you know, is getting your best thoughts, getting committee together, think through the issue we want to recommend, getting the data analysis, and having staff to work with you to come up with a set of recommendations. I think the work of generative AI and others will change the way we do things dramatically, right? 
So I'm pleading with you, don't have another discussion about how great or how you worried. Let's have some guidance. Now, I recognize it's too early to say, how can we be so definitive to have guidance? But I can tell you people like me are saying, at least say to me, this is what I think we ought to be looking at now. This is what are the issues. And this is, I'd love to see a publication from you guys that this, in fact, is the publication I'm going to use to guide my work for the next few years, recognizing the need to change. Right? So that's what I hope we come out from the meeting. Michael heard me talk about this many times. I think the world's needing some definitive, but well, definitive is not the right word because nothing's definitive, but something that's clear from experts that's useful for me to think about if, you know, if I were going to go and see a patient, how can I use it? Now, I recall back my days as an intern when I stay up late at night to write history of physical soap. Maybe I can use it much more smarter. Actually, I was one of those who actually had a template. And I, those days, zero copied it. And I filled in the template along all the soaps. And one of my attendings says, you can't do that. <laughs> I got to write it for de novo. But you know what I'm, where I'm going, right? Discharge summaries, things like that. So get down to some practicalities in terms of saying the publication from the NAM with your assistance said this is how we should be thinking if I were an educator. This is how we maybe start thinking about changing curriculum. This is how we think about problem solving. And as a practitioner, I would like to know what you tell me that I can use it for how do I use it for, and what I should be concerned about using it for, but more practicality, right? And as a policymaker, and the work that we do here, we need guidance. So I can tell you within the National Academies we already have a working group that's given us guidance the use of generative AI, right? You can imagine how useful it is in many things that we do, right? The other day we had a retirement of uh, the chief financial officer, and I went to chat GPT and say, can you write me a poem about chief financial officer? Did it much better than I did. <laughs> but you have to recognize that you can't rely on it alone. You have to at least disclose you used it, but then you really need human guidance at the end of the day, right? So those are the kind of things I really want you to be able to say, right? Um, I think it was one of your meetings, my, uh, uh, Mike, when we asked Zach Cohen, who I guess is the New Journal AI ed editor, um, can you use generative AI to write your paper? I think his answer was yes. So people say, really what? When I said it to my daughter, she says, Daddy, you're cheating, <laughs> right? And she said that to me. So, but Zach says, if you are in China, they don't speak the language really well. But you're a scientist. How do you think you get the paper written? You got someone to write it for you. Now, I'm not saying for or against. I'm just saying the rationale of thinking through this thing, right? The science has to be yours. The data has to be yours. But there are many ways in which this kind of, at least generative AI can be helpful. But I'm thinking in general this whole area. So I'm going to close by simply saying that that's what I hope we're going to do is coming up with something that's more practical. At least, I mean, coming up with something for you is going to be great. You, you, you see each other all the time. But coming up with something for me, it will be great to say, ah, I remember in 2023, there was these major articles that shaped my thinking. And admittedly, this continues to evolve, but it helped me think about where I should be versus more and more chat about it's going to transform you got to be worried about this. There's a lot of risk. I think we all know this. Even an average individual knows this. Question is, help us get something useful for everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Victor. And um, I think you'll be um, pleased with the results of this session. Uh, uh, and. Um, the way it is, uh, its lessons are captured uh, as uh, an important first stage in what will be a long, long journey. 
uh, but one that's moving very fast. Uh, and uh, uh, the challenge to us uh, in many ways is to ensure the understanding and comfort level uh, among all the parties involved as well as uh, identification of benchmarks of progress and goals and practical insights uh, for the for the work. So the planning committee that uh, has uh, put together uh, the meeting I want to acknowledge, uh, which has been just an extraordinary group and has very much in mind the notion of how we can l use the conversation today uh, to provide the kind of uh, uh, progress toward a framework uh, that can be used as a touchstone reference point uh, for all of us. Uh, the, I want to just read the names of the planning committee off. Uh, Diane B uh, Babsky from NIH, Matthew Diamond from the FDA, Peter Emby from Vanderbilt, uh, Jackie Gerhardt from Epic, uh, Judy uh, Warira Yashoya from Emory, uh, Jennifer Goldsack from the Digital Medical Medicine Society, uh, Jennifer Layden from CDC, uh, Tom Maddox, who's the chair, and I'll introduce in just a moment, uh, and Troy Sarich from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. So thanks again to the uh, planning committee. If we can just give them a round of applause for the good work. <laughs> Under their guidance, um, the staff um, has put together a really very helpful, uh, handy um, a, br a briefing, uh, book of briefing materials that includes the meeting agenda and the participant list. Again, we didn't go individually around the room, but you can remind yourselves by looking at that participant list and using it as a, as a means of follow-up uh, for the uh, conversations that we're having. In addition, under the section for background materials, you see some of the work that has been done under NAM auspices, uh, but also uh, work that is uh, uh, providing key reference points uh, for administration uh, initiatives and work in this area. Uh, the Risk Management Framework, the Blueprint for an AI uh, Bill of Rights, the White House Roundtable on AI and Health. And then after that uh, set of uh, background materials and uh, article excerpts, there's a very nice bibliography um, of places online in which if you have particular interest in one or another aspect uh, of the issues that we're talking about today, they're easily accessible. Follow that is uh, uh, some background on uh, on your sponsor, if you will, the uh, NAM Leadership Consortium and the National Academy of Medicine generally, and then participant biographies. Uh, so uh, again, thanks to the staff uh, under the, the uh, leadership of the planning committee for a very handy uh, set of references for today's meeting. Now it's my very great pleasure to um, uh, introduce uh, Tom Maddox, uh, who's a, a senior uh, health system uh, executive uh, at uh, BJC Healthcare. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, and um, he at uh, uh, BJC Healthcare in Washington University leads its digital health and innovation programs. He's a practicing cardiologist, a professor at uh, WashU uh, of medicine, a health services researcher, and a national uh, leader in cardiology professional societies, including uh, his current service on the American College of Cardiology's uh, Board of Trustees. Tom, thank you very much and welcome. Well, good morning. Um, it's exciting. I forget when the planning process started several months ago. Uh, and, and it's fun to see the, the ideas and the hopes for that planning committee materialize with the faces and expertise that's in this room. I think Michael said it well, this is a really unique collection of technology, clinical, and governmental regulatory expertise. And it's really, really important. When I, along with my colleagues back home at my home institution, are um, working with our AI initiatives, I think we recognize that there's a little bit of old and a little bit of new. In many ways, and you all are very familiar with this, a lot of the issues around the responsible use of data and digital technologies is going to be very similar to how do we apply it to AI. But what I have found in our early experience with generative AI is sort of three things to me seem new, and that is the dynamism of the models and how they just change almost minute by minute. 
The, genera the generative capability in particular of these foundational models is obviously something new that we as clinicians and in medicine need to think deeply about and sort of get our arms around this new frontier. And then finally, um, the fact that, um, that often what's happening is we're dealing in language. And I've, I'm not yet totally sure how to think about the concept. But as I think about my individual interactions with patients, language is almost as powerful a tool as a medicine or a medical procedure that I can provide. And now that we have these emerging models that are generating that kind of intervention, I think it introduces a new and, and a fairly novel degree of responsibility in how we deploy it and use it, not only for our providers and their education and their delivery of care, but then how our patients receive and interpret it. I think one of the things we've all seen that we're confused about with hallucinations is the authoritative nature, at least they seem to be delivered in written form. And when you have that degree of authoritative nature, particularly by patients, there's an added layer of risk as well as an added layer of opportunity. So I think having those concepts in mind as we think about developing the framework for responsible use of this technology, to me anyway, seems like a helpful approach and we'll, we'll very much need all of y'all's collective experience on this. So if I could go to the agenda, what I wanted to do is walk through what the planning committee has come up with and what I'd, I'd like to acknowledge, it's not just the names you saw on the slide and the staff members who've been critical developing it. We've got broad stakeholder input and this is gonna be something that's critical for all of our efforts that we continue to engage the community broadly. So we've broken the day up into four general areas, and I'll point you to the titles listed in the dark blue um, bars here. So the first is, of course, to set the framework about some of the emerging opportunities that we're seeing. I know a lot of us have been thinking about this daily, and we'll have some speakers, as you can see, Peter, Sebastian, Pete, um, from Microsoft and Google, as well as the reactors you see listed there. And a lot of this effort will be, how do we start to put our arms around the real application of this technology? Thinking about Victor's charge about, let's get practical here. How are we going to do this in the domains of medical care, medical education, public health, drug development, all the other aspects that go into the biomedical ecosystem? With that then, later in the morning, we will look towards how can we think about some of the risks or just nuances of the technology that we need to have in mind as we're starting to deploy this into the field? And so um, thinking a little bit about that with Jennifer facilitating and the speaker as you see listed here on the lower part of the slide. Then if you go to the next slide, please. After lunch, we'll have some frame setting about a really important aspect of AI, and that is our responsible oversight of that. And so my fellow planning committee member, Matt, will speak to that, give some framing comments to start off the afternoon. And then I think we need to think about how do our sectors align? Obviously, we're in DC. Obviously, there's an important role for the federal government, but it is only one sector of many in this ecosystem, and everybody is going to have a role in the responsible use of this technology. So how do we think about what is the role of the individual practitioners, the health systems, the developers, not only the technology developers, but the developers of medical care, and then obviously our technology partners who are going to be uh, major influencers in how this tool is developed and deployed. And then the last part of the day, will be getting into specifically the federal policy, what we need to think about what already exists that just needs to be applied to this, and what might need to be developed anew. And so you'll see that um, facilitated by Troy and then the speakers there. So that's the day we're gonna get through. Um, a couple of things that I charge everybody here with. One is uh, I'd like you to think about potential solutions and regulatory approaches that can help all of us overcome some of the current barriers that we can see and we'll discuss, so that, and to, to invoke Michael's phrase, that we have action, that we're able to come out of this with clear steps about practical things to do to move this technology towards its potential. I'd also say if you're seeing knowledge gaps that exist and remain, and there are many, 
please surface them. The idea is to collect them all so that we continue to build that agenda for further exploration and development. As you guys may see from the cameras in the back, we're live streaming the event, so try and keep some side conversations to a minimum so we don't disrupt the audio feed. If you do have a question or comment throughout the day, you have a table tent in front of you, just turn it up. That'll be assigned to us and the uh, facilitators around the room that you have a question. We'll have mics coming around and please wait for that so that we can clearly capture your questions and comments in the system. And then um, don't uh, try not to speak out of turn. We'll, we'll pay close attention to everybody raising their table tents and calling you in order. So with that, I think, um, unless there's any other housekeeping that you can think of, we will transition to our first panel. So I'll ask um, the four uh, the panelists up here. There's a mix of people in person as well as uh, virtually. So I think Sebastian will be our in-person pre presenter. And then we're going to have our reactors. Should we have them come up now, you think? Sure. OK, we'll have the reactors come up as well. So if, if Sebastian, Philip, Jackie, Vincent, and Stephen could all come up, please. So as they're doing that, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the speakers that we have. So Peter Lee is the Corporate Vice President of Research and Incubations at Microsoft. He leads Microsoft Research and there incubates new research-powered products and lines of business in areas such as AI, Computing Foundations, Health and Life Sciences. As you all know, he speaks and writes widely and, and authoritatively on science and technology trends. Before he arrived at Microsoft in 2010, he was at DARPA where he established a new technology office that created operational capabilities in machine learning, data science, and computational social science. Prior to that, professor and head of computer science department at Carnegie Mellon. Sebastian Brubeck is a senior principal research man manager and leads the Machine Learning Foundations Group at Microsoft Research. He joined uh, the research group in 2014 after three years as an assistant professor at Princeton. He received several best paper awards at machine learning conferences for his work on online decision making, convex optimization, and adversarial robustness. Pete Clardy is a pulmonary and critical care physician and a senior clinical specialist at Google Health, where he and his team support the development of safe, secure, and intuitive elect electronic health information solutions for providers. Together with internal and external partners, they build tools that facilitate clinical workflows through search and summarization solutions, leveraging Google's large language models delivered through its cloud. We have the next slide for the, uh, for the reactors, please. That one, uh, battery's a challenge, huh? Oh, <laughs> and now GPT will take us through the rest of the... All right, we don't have pictures up right now. Let me go through the, uh, the four reactors and then we'll start with Peter Lee. So Philip Payne is the Janet and Bernard Becker Professor and Director of the Institute for Informatics, Data Science and Biostatistics at Washington University in St. Louis. He also serves as the Associate Dean for Health Information and Data Scientist and is the Chief Data Scientist for the School of Medicine. Jackie Gerhardt is a family medicine physician and clinical informaticist at Epic. At Epic, she focuses on healthcare innovation such as the use of ambient voice for documentation and the use of the EHR data to advance the knowledge of medicine and patient-centered care. She is the lead clinical researcher for Epic Research and publishes studies on epicresearch.org. Vincent Liu is a senior research scientist at Kaiser Permanente, Northern California Division of Research. He also directs the Systems Research Initiative, a multidisciplinary team at the Division of Research supported by the Permanente Medical Group. His work focuses on the intersection of sepsis, acute severe illness, informatics, and care, healthcare delivery with the goal of building towards a learning healthcare system. He is a widely recognized expert in applied informatics. Stephen Waldron is the Vice President and Chief Medical Informatics Officer at the American Academy of Family Physicians. He is a nationally recognized expert in health information technology and has over 15 years of experience in the field. Prior to joining the AAFP, Dr. Waldron was the National Library of Medicine Medical Informatics Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Missouri-Columbia. 